All right. I'm super excited because this episode is going to be with uh, not only a marketing friend, but a local friend, somebody here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, we'll get into some of those details in a little bit here. But Steve, I want to just start off. We had a conversation recently. We talked ad costs are soaring. Advertisers are worried about CPM, CPAs are just causing trouble on top of all the tracking issues and compliance challenges that have come up in the last couple of years. So are we all doomed? Should we just resign ourselves to paying more? Or is there a better way? It's a good question. Uh, a lot of times, if you continue to do the same thing and you get rising, rising costs, I think you are kind of due, unless you have fat, fat <laughs> margins with it. Uh, the way that we always look at it, like it just forces us to be better marketers. You know, it was one of those things when everything is dirt, dirt, dirt cheap, we can throw crap out there and people will buy it and it's fine. But as things get more expensive, it's like you just have to hone your craft that much more. That's what gets me excited about working with people that really truly understand marketing or good at marketing, do the direct marketing or even brand marketing, that type of stuff. Um, because it gets away from some of that slog to a certain extent. Um, it allows you to really kind of focus on uh, potentially what you do best. And it also kind of forces you to get away from just creating ads over and over and over and over and over again. It says, why now? Why now? Why now? Why now? I know you don't know me. I know you don't trust me, but hey, why now? It makes you think about it in a completely different way. Awesome. So uh, by the end of today's episode, we're going to make everybody better marketers, uh, presumably. Yes. Um, so Steve Molly is the founder of Molly Marketing. Uh, and just a little bit off script before we get into the bio here. He was one of those people when when I met him and I started to realize where our networks overlapped. I was like, I know that I'm speaking to a really awesome person here. Like, because people that I really respect are the people that he knows and that really he really respects and all of that. So, you know, it's just been a great opportunity there. So Steve speaks at conferences throughout the Midwest on relevant topics, such as how businesses can stop lighting their marketing dollars on fire and gain trackable, predictable results. Uh, his main focus day to day is strategy and media buying, along with his role of, you know, writing paychecks and owning the company. Um, he he and the team's work has resulted in Molly Marketing winning over a dozen American Marketing Association Prism Awards, and that award focuses on results-based campaigns. So it's not just you know uh, advertisers scratching each other's back. He also sits on the board for the Nebraska Travel Association, the Public Policy Committee for the City of Lincoln, along with numerous business boards in his home base of Lincoln, Nebraska. And away from the office, he chases little white balls around the golf course and is passionate about continuing education. Um, so let's see. My next question that I have here is, is kind of related to that first one, um, but it kind of speaks to some of the things we'll talk about later. Why is the old direct response ad model of just, hey, we have this great offer, you know, come here and buy it. Why is that failing right now? Why is that uh, causing so much trouble? Because that old model, kind of what we were talking about before, is when it's cheap, it can work out really, really, really well. Because then, yeah. you know, if you have a well converting offer, you have a well converting, you know, website and all that, you know, rough, rough, you're talking about three to seven percent of traffic, rough, rough. Well, that still means 93 percent of traffic is not buying for that. Well, if it's cheap enough, you can retarget the 93 percent over and over and over and over and over again. As it gets more expensive, you just can't. And it's interesting because in this direct response world, um, you know, I'm in a mastermind with a bunch of people that are very much in that direct response world. And there's another agency owner in there about four years ago that we were chatting about stuff. And then his agency side of it, we do the same thing. We do a ton of direct response. We do a ton of traditional marketing as well, branding and all that. And I was talking with Hugh and he was like, you know what, man? I'm like, what's that? He's like, we do. We do branding work. You know, almost like brandy was a dirty word. And yeah. it was so funny. And that's what it was like for a long time. In the last couple of years, we've seen a change. But I think because of the raising costs as a whole, you really have to focus that much more on just brand and building that, like building that credibility um, and that trust factor kind of across the board. Um, because we've seen it time and time again, if you have a strong brand, your acquisition costs go way down. Like we have one client that's in the, the apparel space is that he's been direct response marketer for 25 years, maybe 30 years here at this point in time, even was early, early on. Um, and what he sells, and for a long time, you know, he's always pushed it more on that direct response side of it, where you take a company that really kind of builds out the brand side of it, and he's the first one to admit, um, is now that brand company can get sales for about a, you know 80% less than what he's getting on that direct response model. So even he's taking a look at making a shift 
towards that. I'm not saying all of your money has to go towards brand whatsoever, but at least balance yeah. that out, have a little more of a shift. Well, it's, I mean, it's kind of the sweet spot that was laid out decades ago by David Ogilvy. Like he talked about how important it was that he had this entire background and, and, um, foundation of direct response, but at the same time, most of the work that was coming out of uh, his agency was not like overtly direct. It it didn't look like a Gary Halbert sales letter, right? Right, right. And the thing I love about Ogilvy, that dude never had a pixel to optimize things off of, and yet he made his clients billions of dollars in total revenue. Yeah, yeah. So, we talked a few weeks ago, just kind of catching up, and um, you share with me an ad strategy that you're using that is particularly effective in the context of this environment, right? Um, and specifically, you talked about leveraging audience collection and soft commitments and how that's helping you get great ROAS for clients. You know, kind of, I, I think whether or not you think of brands as a logo, this strategy to me kind of creates a brand. Uh, in the in the prospect's mind, and then leverages that brand. And so, if you don't mind, like I'd love to explore that strategy a bit here. Um, can you can you kind of get give the overview for folks? For, yeah, the for biggest thing is let's date. You know, let's date with the prospect. Well, that comes down to let's offer them some value up front. You know, maybe it's some blog articles, maybe it's some video articles. Um, even at that point in time, after they've re- or consumed a little bit of your content, maybe then it goes into kind of the lead magnet side of it. But all we're doing is looking for soft commits along the way, you know, getting 15, 20 cent clicks, if you will, over to a blog, retarget them to another blog, retarget them to a video. And when I talk about videos too, I'm talking about a little bit longer form videos. And there's a ton of, I know we had this conversation too, like yeah. there's a ton of definitions of short form, long form. Um, from our perspective, a lot of times people are always like, Hey, shorter, the better needs to be 30 seconds, 60 second tops, and then kind of move on from us. We'd love the three, four five, seven minute, 10 minute videos because it shows interest. You know, the thing that we joke about a lot of times is like, for me personally is like, I'm not a big fan of cats. So hopefully your podcast listeners <laughs> aren't necessarily huge cat fans. Um, but like half my family's allergic to cats and because of that we will never adopt a cat. But with yeah. that being said, I've watched a bajillion cat videos that are 30 seconds long because I have 30 seconds to waste. I'm not going to watch a four minute cat video. You know, so if I'm yeah. watching for something that long, like I'm raising my hand that I'm interested in this type of stuff. So then we set up all kinds of retargeting pools based on just consumption and get them to consume a bunch of content and get build up that credibility before we deliver and make that offer of come buy from us. Um, and we can get people to watch seven, eight minute videos at times of good content. Uh, for yeah. you know, 12, 12 cents, 15 cents. And I'd rather spend that money all day long and then retarget yeah. them and spend a couple of dollars per click. Let me let me throw a hypothetical at you. This is well, it's not so hypothetical. It's it's based on a particular uh somebody I've been speaking with recently, but I'm not going to give away too much of the specifics of their business. So they have a fairly high ticket offer. They don't have they have a great audience built. Um, for a different offer, but not for this high ticket offer, right? The, the overlap is very small. So they're looking to go after a new audience for this high ticket offer. And it's um, it's a consultative selling close, right? And so if they're looking to build that up, um, he was telling me that he has certain assets. Like he has, he's put together like 20 informational videos that are compelling around helping people discover the benefits of this high ticket offer. So 20 different video assets that you're working with. And then uh, a fairly straightforward sales process. It's like book an introductory call, see if this this is something you'd be interested in. So if somebody shows up to you with something like that, how does that work in the context of, of what we're talking about here? And he has articles and stuff like that too, but just kind of try to apply this on on a on the ground level. Um, what's what's the approach there? See, something like that is perfect because it's content that's already in the can. And it's not like they have to create a bunch of new content. Um, make an assumption here, but I'm assuming that content actually helps them solve a little bit of an issue. Maybe not the full issue, but at least a little bit of an issue, delivering some good value. Um, mm-hmm. So what we do is we just set that up in a kind of a rotation. We'll test out some cold audiences um, with that to see what really resonates. 
Um, but a decent chunk of the spend will then go to what we coin kind of hot seven. Anybody that's engaged with you in any way period over the last seven days. And the hot 28, same thing, but over a 28 day period of time, taking out those things. Um, and then really kind of seeing which ones bring in kind of the lowest cost to you know, build up kind of the most value. And then really yeah. kind of maximize that. And just only then after they've consumed quite a bit inside of that channel, then make them that offer. And we'll see it a lot because if you can solve somebody's issue or a couple of their issues early on, leave them with that value when you make that next ask, it's easier for them to actually accept it. So from the audience perspective, what's going on is like, oh, I found this interesting video on Facebook and I started watching it for a while. And then a day or two later, I'm seeing more interesting videos from that same person. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. This is interesting. And because I'm responding, because I'm engaging with those different videos, then I'm seeing even more content from this person. And suddenly I start to have a relationship, a recognition of that person, a brand, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, this person suddenly has a brand in, in my perspective or, or, you know, from my perspective, and then I'm predisposed to, if the, if I'm asked to click off Facebook and, and go like consume more content there, or if I'm given more of a direct offer versus something that's just a, Hey, this article might be interesting to you, then I'm more likely to go there. And so you're saying that brings down total cost of acquisition, even if you're paying for that same person to view content one and two and three and four before there's the the action. It's interesting because we have a lot of case studies around it because one of the first questions we always get is like, hey man, like I don't want them to have to watch four or five videos, read a couple of blogs before even make them an offer. That sounds super, super expensive. Um, but in reality, we're generally talking about pennies on the dollar to get them to consume this much content. Um, there's a guy that we know that's been in the internet marketing, internet marketing space for a decade plus, probably at this point in time. Um, and it actually, actually started up with a dating coach. And this is, you know, back with 10, 15 years ago when a ton of people were kind of dating coaches. Uh, but he really knew his stuff. And it was interesting as he talked about it on the dating coach side of it. If you meet up with somebody is that you do want them to quote unquote, kind of follow you to three or four or five different places. So that could be like, we meet up. He's like, hey, you know, can you come with me to the bar to get a drink? She comes with me to the bar to get a drink. He's like, hey, can you come meet my friends? Follows me to meet my friends. Hey, let's go chat with your friends. Follows me to chat with your friends and then go outside. And so she follows you kind of outside. Well, that's four different points of contact where she's literally kind of following you. And that was part of it, not his entire thing, part of his blueprint to get somebody like that to trust you. It's the same thing yeah. online. It truly is. Let's say, let's take them to different places. Let's, you know, kind of follow them along a, a certain path to a certain extent to build up that, again, I always say it, no like and trust. Because once yeah. that happens, then it becomes so much easier to make that next ask. The other side of it, once you start building that audience up, um, if you have a new offer, you know, a new offer that's aligned, you can do testing instead of audience really pretty cheap than necessarily have to spend thousands of dollars and a colder audience to see if this new funnel, this new offer might have any legs or not. Yeah, so I've I've heard that this audience collection also described as having an invisible list, right? So as yeah, direct response marketers, we we love this idea of like, oh, my email list is so big, right? And I've 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 added this many new subscribers to my email list and all of that this month. That's actually a really hard thing to do. And it's an expensive thing to do in the context of this. But with the power of retargeting or remarketing, you have the ability to have these invisible lists that you're able to build cheaper. Oh. Um, so let's talk more, I guess, a little bit about what that, like, um, if your ads are only designed to get the click and get the opt-in, like that's a limitation versus what you're, what you're able to do with this audience collection method. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. And so let's just say it's an easy lead magnet, if you will. And say everything's optimized fairly well. So they're opting in a, you know, with a nice warm audience. Let's just call it 40%, you know, a decent opt-in percentage. Yeah. Um, that still means that 60% are not ready right now to even give you their email address. Um, so instead of asking them for their email address again and again and again, you just kind of get them back into that cycle, show them a different video, show them a little bit different content um, to get them to come back. Because the old analogy we used to talk about is kind of like sawdust is that, you know, eventually you're building a house, you get a ton of sawdust, like, what are you going to do with it? Well, this is the sawdust. Like, this is different ways to get those people just kind of re-engaged because it all comes down to timing. Like, there's been things I've been super interested in. It's just right now, I don't have time. Fast forward three weeks later, cool, timing's a lot better for it. So it's yeah. just being able to be in front of them on a consistent basis to, for when they realize the timing. 
audience, right? So like one audience would be people who viewed a certain video to 75%. One audience could be people who've who've clicked but did not convert. Obviously, there's the audience of people who clicked and converted for you know some lead magnet or other free offer. Uh, so there's all of these different audiences that if you can define them at this point, you like you can often retarget them, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I also think that one of one of the things that gives you an advantage in the context of this, and maybe you can speak to this, is with all the iOS 14 like big question mark over tracking and all of that. Um, when you're looking at, for example, video views in a in a paid campaign on Facebook, that's all first party data that Facebook mm-hmm. Facebook can track who views what videos and how much on their website without anybody without any congressional oversight coming down on them, right? <laughs> right. Um, the, Congress is not going to say, you can't track who viewed what videos on your platform, right? Yep. Or YouTube, because the same principles and strategy applies there, right? I know that you sure. focus on Facebook. Um, but that that gives you that gives you a lot of power that's not necessarily available if the only way you think about retargeting is, can I get somebody to click? And what did they do on my site? And that's part of the reason why we haven't seen just cost in our case just skyrocket or results that's really kind of fall down a ton is just because it is first part of data, like you said. So those lists, those invisible lists continue to get updated kind of behind the scenes and really continues to remain fresh. And then it just comes down to timing. So then if the timing is right within that seven day window, let's call it on meta and that seven day window that we have for attribution and it's, and it's perfect and it works out really well. Uh, so yeah, we don't. I mean, obviously, there's always some tracking issues um, on the pure yeah. marketing side of it. Sometimes it's kind of nice we have some tracking issues. But the simple fact is that it's tough to ever prove out this one video got this one person <laughs> to sign up for this high ticket thing. It's always numerous touch points, always. Yeah. And now we can put in numerous touch points. Um, no one will have some droppage tracking wise with it. Um, but if the numbers that they all match up, then doesn't necessarily matter as much. And we stopped focusing so much on this one asset that created this one action that we wanted to do and understand it's an ecosystem that we really have to fill out. Yeah, makes a ton of sense to me. Um, and so in the context of that, you have to be a little bit careful because getting distribution on one particular video or one particular ad may seem pretty expensive. But um, if that is feeding the later touch points, um, then then you have to look at it in context of total account ROAS or total yep. funnel ROAS. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what we always um, take a look at is total, total. What does this really kind of look like? You know, we try to yeah. maximize the ones that have fat ROAS, but at the end of the day, we know we have to build some audiences up in order to get that fat ROAS. So total, total. Was that? Yeah. So if, if a client comes to you and does not have a bunch of creative assets in place, um, I, the way that I, Break this down is is you have a couple different ads that you're using for this. One is what we can call maybe an audience collection ad, right? Mm-hmm. And then one it, one is maybe the retargeting ad that's it's you know top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel, right? The retargeting, um, maybe retargeting is not the right the right word, but like the offer ads, right? The off, there's the audience collection ads and the offer ads. How do you approach the creative for that? Or how would you encourage clients to approach the creative for those different types of ads? That's part of our onboarding process overall is kind of taking them through some of that process if they don't have any good content that's already been created um, and kind of talk through just quick little scripts. Here's some different things you can kind of think about and do. You know, most of the time your phone is going to be perfectly fine, with the lighting and you know, kind of a good audio source. Um, and so we walk them through that. What we try to do is make sure that it's not like, hey, Roy, I need you to go in the studio for the next like 10 hours and pump out all this content for us to get it. Um, what we're trying to do is like, all right, you're already, when you're making your presentations, you're making your offers or maybe it's an ebook or a download or whatever you already have, let's just verbalize it. You know, take yeah. one chapter, one component, or we have one client that put together 210 tips for artists. Grab four tips, you know, four <laughs> tips in this video, four tips in this video, four tips in this video. And hey, if you want a little bit more information, here's what I go for it. So it's trying to repurpose content. Ideally, they already have one way or another. Um, it yeah. just happens for them to be in front of a, you know, a camera at that point in time to really get it done. We would try to make it as painless as possible because people do. Yeah. Read on, oh my God, so, it's been so time consuming. All of those are like the audi- audience collection ads. Those are the 
um, hey, we just we just want something that's going to um, attract and engage our target buyer, right? Like we just want the the content. You can put a CTA on the end of it, right? But it, the point is not the CTA. The point is, can we get someone to watch this or to read this blog post or whatever? Yep. Yep. Correct. Okay. Correct. And then the offer ads are going to look much more like what we think of as traditional ads, right? Exactly. Even with that too, um, and I know this isn't exactly what you kind of asked, but even with those offer ads, is we still use a little bit longer form content. And that's a little bit longer form written content more after that, just to help fill in some of those gaps. We've seen quite a few times if the content is short and sweet, we'll get a lot more clicks. We yeah. won't get as many conversions on the back end of it. So even yeah. ready for the offer, we still use that story to help kind of qualify for the people before they even click over that landing page where we're going to go to take that next step. Is there anything like um, social proof testimonials or uh, other elements that you find work particularly well in those in those later, more middle of funnel, bottom of funnel ads? Yeah, middle of funnel for sure and towards the bottom as well. Um, so we talk about kind of top of funnel, long form content to qualify them. Um, middle, but especially bottom. Bottom could be short form. I mean, we can talk about 15 seconds, 30 seconds, just a brand reminder. Hey, you already know me. We already have this relationship. Um, yeah. And that stuff can work out really fairly well. Um, the other component too is once they do get to know you, that content can shrink here a little bit. So the written content I'm talking about here at this point in time. So it doesn't necessarily have to be as long to really kind of fill in those gaps for people. Um, but long, or excuse me, um, kind of middle testimonials, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and again, what we've seen, I just pulled this actually for a report. It's a company that does about $70 million a year in revenue. And I broke down all their videos, what's working, what's not working. Um, and really the best one testimonial wise is just that person with the iPhone talking directly to it. And that versus the polished testimonial of like talking head, let me show you an action shot. Let's jump into this. Let's do that because it's just not as aesthetic. You know, I can relate to yeah. you as a talking head. I can't relate to you if you're climbing a mountain here right now in between different shots, trying to tell me why I should buy this product. So those test yeah. have worked out really, really well. Um, and even like some of the ads where you have, you know, five-star reviews and we have over 5,000 people, five-star reviews and like that type of content, just social proof helps really melt towards the bottom as well. Yeah. All of that, all of that kind of speaks to this whole idea of building a brand and Okay, so so I, I keep trying to qualify the use of the word brand. What do you think of when you talk about mixing direct response and brand? What do you think of in terms of brand? Because I know that like a visual image might be part of it, but it's not all of it. Yeah. Um, so Ryan Dice came up with this definition seven, eight, nine years ago. And I've always really loved it. And you know, this isn't exactly it, but how we define brand was more or less putting more deposits into somebody's equity bucket before you ask to receive something. And I just really thought that that captured, especially the online brand world, really, really well. And so that's what I look at with brand, is what can we do to build up that equity bucket before we ask for anything back out. So it's like the total experience with and impression of the company um, is, is, is everything that's gone in and then actually asking for the sale is everything that you pull out of the equity bucket. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. Well, it's like uh, Dan Kennedy talked about, you know, branding is a happy byproduct of direct response, but also branding comes about through um, someone's experience of purchasing, right? Um, sure. Which which I think was the, the the happy byproduct. And and maybe in direct mail days, you were kind of forced into that type of mix of brand and direct response because, um, didn't have the same capacity that you can do that, that you have today. Um, but today you can, you can create that experience through, you know, a two, three minute video that shows up in their Facebook feed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's interesting too. There's a book that it's kind of mandatory reading in the office called the long and the short of it. Um, and it okay. is kind of like an academic textbook, if you will. I think on Amazon it's like 70 bucks or whatever, but the long and the short of it. And it talks about uh, short-term sales activation balanced with long-term brand building. And the key is to have that balance of both. And it completely depends on the industry that you're in, the goals you have, and things like that. Uh, but generally speaking, rough, rough. And they took a look at numerous campaigns and studies and businesses and all this. So again, it's not just like, hey, man, this worked out really well for me. You should do the same thing. 
Um, yeah. So with all the data they found out, the split should be roughly 65, 70% on the brand, and then about 30% on the um, kind of the sales activation. Because sales activation, if you're always in that mode, you'll see the peaks and the valleys. Um, you know, if you have that buy now stuff going on right now, you'll see a peak, you know, kind of shut some of that stuff off or pull back to see a valley. But if it's a brand building, it becomes a lot more consistent. So it's balanced out both as you go along with it. Now, some products yeah. you can do more of a 50-50 split. Um, other ones, like a lot of times financial, sometimes that has to be almost like an 80-20 split because, you know, you just have to build up so much trust when it gets a piece of money, if you will. But that book does For a sure. good job breaking that down. Well, and and I think the cool thing about this the strategy of kind of approaching the two different parts separately is, uh, for example, I'm I was thinking of someone who who does these events like in person events, right? So you could be you could be building the audience twenty four seven, right? You could yeah. be building the audience, building the brand all the time, and then if you have let's say quarterly events, you're going to have maybe a series of early bird discounts and, you know, like all of those very, you know, sales activation um, oriented ads that can just tap into the ongoing brand building that you're doing, that you have access to the audiences that you're, that you're building. And maybe that doesn't perfectly align with the seven and 28 day thing, but it's still, um, it still can follow it from a, a principles level. For sure. For sure. Um, okay. So uh, you also mentioned that some counterintuitive ad approaches are working in certain circumstances. Like I, the, the term that I wrote down is, is newsfeed webinar, right? Like, Oh God. Uh, yeah. Running a, no. a newsfeed webinar. So um, can you explain that or, and, and, and maybe dive into any other interesting approaches that you've seen work that are, are worth testing? Yeah. And so again, this varies all across the board when it comes to costs and everything else like that. Um, but I know what four years ago, and we'll take you know COVID, especially when COVID first hit and things were really cheap webinar wise. I don't know. Uh, but four or five years ago, you get somebody to at least sign up for a webinar, four to seven bucks, rough, rough. Um, yeah. Now at times, again, depends on the offer. Sometimes it's 15 to 20 bucks and that's a sign up, not show up. <laughs> you know, I mean, we get pretty happy with a 40% show up. Yeah. And so, you know, those numbers become pretty rough on the whole side of it. So what we actually have done is taken that entire webinar um, in 45, 50 minutes and put that inside the newsfeed to get people to watch even 25% of it because it shows a high, high level of interest. And we've had people consume entire webinars just in their newsfeed. Same thing with this, like podcast, video podcast. We've taken this type of asset and put this entire interview inside of a newsfeed. A lot of times we'll kind of chunk it up into more sound bites, but at times we've tested it out with the entire interview. Um, and that's worked out extremely well for qualifications. I mean, it's kind of like TV to a certain extent, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you're 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 just getting people to um just giving people an opportunity to engage with the content where they engage with it. Mm -hmm. Um and one of the things that I talk about in 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 selling, like if you're doing um <laughs> I, I talk about these low threshold offers, right? And so the idea of getting someone to sign up for a sales call, getting someone to call in and they expect to be sold on the phone, say, for example, like some local service, like a financial advisor, right? You, you're, you're, you're doing an ad for a financial advisor and you want them to call your office, but they presume if they call your office, you're just going to try and sell them. You're going to try and, you know, get all of their money moved over, all of that crap that you don't really want versus a, a low threshold offer um, on one level could be, hey, we do a uh, retirement preparedness consultation. Uh, it's a 60 minute appointment where we just go through the numbers and help you figure out how prepared you are for retirement. Um, and then, so that's lower threshold because it's perceived as, value first it's perceived mm -hmm. as um but then on another level there's also you can your call to action for that is not necessarily call and we're going to have a 60 minute conversation but call to schedule your free no obligation retirement preparedness consultation suddenly you know exactly what you're calling for you know that all you're doing on that call is just scheduling something right mm -hmm. <laughs> like and so you're making it super low threshold and i think that the the application here is very similar it's super low threshold to like just start watching a video that shows up in your in your newsfeed no matter if it's a 
two minute video or a 60 minute video, right? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Versus committing to like, oh, I have to give this person my email address for a webinar. And that's still fairly low threshold, but it's it's a much lower threshold to, to get them engaged in their newsfeed. And that's one thing that I like on the other side of it. Once they do schedule that call and I'm seeing the kind of the results of it, of uh, that person they're talking to, you know, I'll pick on the financial advisor, needs to be very intelligent in what they're doing, what they're sharing, offer really good value. But once they start seeing some like buying signs to a certain extent with that, that person in front of them, hey, just, you know, I'm not the one that actually signs a contract. I'm not the one that actually takes you through the whole process to, to sell you, if you will. That's John's job. Let me bring in John. John can talk to you about that. I just want to make sure we're very clear and open that hey, I just want to hear as an audit, hear some details on the whole thing. And that seems to actually work out a ton better um, as well. Because of the full credibility, if I'm here to offer you value for the next 60 minutes, let me offer you value without you being afraid that I'm just trying to upsell you on that next thing. Now, if you yeah. show interest, cool, let me just bring in John. He, you could talk to him. So that way the relationship still remains strong here. Yeah. Well, and even if it's even if it's one person doing the closing, they can still say, hey, at the end of this, we're going to talk about what what makes sense as far as moving forward together. We reserve that for the last five minutes. Right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but in the next 55 minutes, we're going to just focus on, you know, answering these questions and providing all the value that we can here. Yep. Um, I so from. you're also working with clients on some more traditional media. In fact, I saw on your website that you uh, at one point had a billboard at like 14th and O Street, which in Lincoln is kind of like the center of downtown, right? You had a big billboard. Um, and so there, you play in lots of different, often more traditional media. And I, I find it interesting because your agency is kind of split between even when we first met, you said, well, we do this percentage direct response. We do this percentage of people who probably don't know a direct response is. Yep. And so you have this unique perspective. Um, so let's talk about these other media, um, often online media. Uh, isn't that like super expensive? Do people still consume it? Like, yeah, uh, is it question. worth looking at for direct marketers too? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so it's interesting if you take a look at just pure CPM costs when you're making buys. Um, and then I just pulled this, I had a presentation here a couple of days ago for an association here in Nebraska. And so I pulled the most recent ones and looked at a bunch of different meta accounts. So the rough, rough CPM costs 25 to 35 bucks overall. Okay. Well, if you take a look at traditional, because you've always been told online's cheap, online's cheap, online's cheap, online's cheap. You take a look at traditional, you have cable TV, CPM cost could be eight bucks. But then you're like, oh, nobody watches cable TV whatsoever anymore. Well, the data still shows there's a decent chunk of an audience that does. Streaming, roughly about 30 bucks. So still right in the middle of what Facebook would be. Billboard costs rough, rough, $9 CPMs. Radio, we just did one last week for, again, $9 CPMs. So some of this stuff can be a third to a fourth of the cost of what it is online. The other aspect of it is once you introduce some of this traditional, the we have a whole presentation around this, but it's kind of that costly signal. Us as human beings are really good at knowing that, hey, that's expensive or, hey, that's cheap. We might not know how expensive or how cheap, but at a gut level, like we're really good at that. That's how we're kind of wired. And so if I see a billboard or TV or something kind of in the physical world, it's like, oh my God, they're running TV ads. TV ads are super expensive. Well, if they're super expensive, they must be a legit company. If they're a legit company, there must be people just like me that I've bought with them in the past. So now I can kind of trust them. We've all seen the opposite online. We've all seen the opposite where we go to buy something online, either it doesn't show up or shows up and it's crap or whatever, but our BS factor is a lot higher when we see it online and we don't give that costly signal to it nearly as much. Um, plus, because we see it in the physical world, initially, we just believe it more than we do kind of yeah. in the, uh, the online. world. And so like going back to that billboard example, you brought up here in, here in Lincoln, we did it for a client and we have a ton of case studies that show this. So we ran digital for that client for three months for this specific campaign, three months prior. Okay. On a date in July, the billboard went up. Um, and then we started tracking the next 30 days after that billboard goes up. We have not changed anything online, haven't changed optimization, everything's the same online. The only thing that changed in that case was the billboard. Um, plus we did a couple of guerrilla marketing things. We spray chalked, spray chalked places around town. It was called, the, the campaign was called Buffalo Bill. Um, so they would see it in a few different places physically. Well, again, we didn't change anything online. Online cost per click went down 92%. 
the opt-in percentage went up. I think in that case, it was like 40, 41%, something like that for what they wanted to do. And time and time and time again, we've seen that exact same thing take place because the thing with digital, you know, you always have it running, you know, traditionally, specifically on dates this happened, we've seen it with like master's companies, we've seen it with financial advisors, we've seen it um, with you know, pain doctors, and, you know, all kinds of stuff where they have a specific date, those costs online just start to drop because now you have a multiplication effect. You see that brand everywhere. You have that credibility with seeing it in the physical world. And it's amazing how big of an impact it makes in the, uh, the online world. Yeah, so it, it, it drives things on a few different levels. I, I love the use of signaling. Um, as as a terminology to understand, like you're you're putting off a certain signal when you invest in that traditional media, the, mm-hmm. you're getting recognition in different modalities and different channels. Um, it's reinforcing, but then obviously the numbers show like what most marketers would say really matters, right? Like you, you know, said, ninety two percent drop. Yeah, it was That's- insane. It's sometimes when I see numbers are really really good, I get paranoid. Like, is this legit? And same thing, really, really bad is this fully legit. So I double checked it numerous times and like it was just a massive, massive drop. Um, and then more often than not, all the case studies that we ran, there's no guarantees of marketing. There's no promises like that. And like, I'm sure there's exceptions to this. Uh, we pulled together well over a dozen case studies when we've done this, you know, take a look at traditional introducing it, what it looks like. We have yet to see a case study where the online costs didn't come down by a considerable uh, percentage. And I would say yes. their minimum is 20 some percent. We see those online costs really kind of come down. So it's interesting so to place together. As soon as you're engaging the audience in multiple media, it brings down the the, the online costs significantly. Yep. yep. Huh. So okay. what we do, because this is a lot of times kind of a follow-up question is like, all right, well, cool. That sounds great. If you're in, in Lincoln, my brand is yeah. more national. What does this look like on the national side of things? Um, so we take direct response marketers in the past, and we actually go through one today, later today with the, the brand. She's been in the health space for probably close to 15 years. She was kind of an OG, if you will. Um, yeah. She's looking at expanding her brand. And so what we're taking a look at is just spot markets. Her brand does really well naturally inside of Dallas and in Orlando. Let's buy some traditional media in those two markets. Let's see the impact that it makes inside of those couple of markets. And then let's kind of bring it, um, bring it up. You're a little bit more the other <laughs> aspect. The, okay, okay. Uh, just one, just funny observation. Yeah. Um, I often say that Claude Hopkins Scientific Advertising is the best book on internet marketing, um, or on modern marketing, even though it was written a hundred years ago. Um, and I'm specifically thinking about how he talks about testing in spot markets. Yeah. Um, it, uh, these things don't change that much. This is just a modern application of it. Okay, continue. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, no worries. So like on the peer direct response, um, here's fear for that. This is what we're chatting about with the client here this afternoon is that she has an email list of about 50,000 people overall. It's awesome. Let's take this email list and she has physical addresses, all kinds of stuff. This list. So let's take this list of 50,000 people. Um, we'll team up with a TV buy where we'll upload that list. Now, everybody that's street, this is a streaming buy. Everybody that's streaming TV that's on this list will see this ad. So it's 50,000 people will see this ad. We're also then going to take direct mail, same list of 50,000 people. So what we're doing is the TV ads will start on a Thursday. Direct mail will hit their inbox or their mailbox, excuse me, on Thursday. Social media ads, Google ads, everything will you know take place on Thursday really as well. So now it makes it feel like you're absolutely everywhere. At the end of the day, it's 50,000 people. It's just the right 50,000 people that are seeing this. So if you want to go more towards that direct response, there's opportunities like that too, if you do have a list already. Or you can purchase the list too, but ideally it's a little bit warm for your mail list. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a form of retargeting of remarketing. It's exactly. it's the same thing except for you're using every media at your disposal, not just keeping it in Facebook or yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's excellent. So, yeah, I think I, I think what makes sense at this point, um, like if 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 a client is coming to your agency um, and they're interested in working with your agency, um, how how do you approach this? Like, what are you looking for? Who are you looking for? Who's a good fit? And then what's your strategic approach to like bringing them up to speed um, within strategies like this? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll answer that last person or last question kind of first, because we've learned okay. through growing pains is what we kind of need. Yeah. 
So our onboarding, uh, it depends on the size of the client and stuff. It could take, you know, two, three weeks to really start to see, um, you know, like the work get ready to go out and be published. It could be three to four weeks. Um, so I do a bunch of these presentations that talk about the multiplication effect of numerous channels, the long and short of a book, um, some of those branding stuff. And so what we'll actually take them through is small little segments of education. So part of the onboarding is not just simply, like, all right, do a dump to us to better understand what you're going through. But hey, here's a 30 minute education on this component. Next week, here's 30 minutes here. Next week, here's 30 minutes there. Um, so that way we can train them and educate them along the process. And we've realized too, the more touch points we have there, the least likely they are to forget why we're doing what we're trying to get done. Um, now in regards to like best type of clients, is it typically, it's those clients that they're already spending money um, typically in marketing that is um, revenue wise, they're really kind of bare minimum ish, right around 2 million plus. Um, it's one of those things that you either were working with a, the owner or you know a CMO, somebody kind of in that role. Um, sometimes we can act as a CMO ish. We're not a fractional CMO at all. You know, that's a whole other <laughs> skill set that obviously you know about that you can kind of do on that side. Um, but we can help set the strategy and then help dictate those type of buys overall. So what we do really well with are those companies that are challenger brands. So they might not lead the market, but they're trying to kind of punch above their weight a little bit. Um, those are fun. Those are we're number ones. two, so we try harder. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and so I'd say bare minimum to really put numerous channels in your marketing plan um, for spend on a monthly basis 10, 10 to fifteen thousand. Kind of paint that picture bare minimum wise. Yeah, yeah, okay, makes sense. Um, and and obviously, like you said, it's not it's not limited. You're you're not just Nebraska. You're you happen to be based here in Lincoln, Nebraska, like I do, but I I don't. You deal with way more Nebraska clients than I do, but both of us have that kind of national, especially for more direct response oriented people. Yeah, because our um, total revenue we get from Lincoln, about 3% of our total revenue is actually from Lincoln. So yeah, most of it's going to be outstate or I'd say so. Yeah, yeah. Very broad. Um, okay. Well, that's that's excellent. So they can book a call. Um, just if somebody if somebody is a good fit for for your agency based on what they've heard, or at least want to figure out if they might be a good fit, they can book a call with you at mollymarketing.com. And that's M-A-L-Y marketing.com. Uh, the link is in the description for those of you watching or listening as well. Um, Steve, any any last like uh, takeaways or action items for people who are looking to, to grow online or offline today? Um, any any final question that we should uh, make sure that we answer here for people today? I guess a couple of things. One is if they want to book a call, I'm more happy to just do an audit wherever they stand right now. If it's an audit of Meta and Google, awesome. If it's an audit, like, hey, here's my total marketing package, TV, radio, all that type of stuff. We look at data every single day. So we can tell pretty quick, this is good, this is good. Hey, here's something that might be a little fishy. Um, and plus we're always pretty open with it. So we had an audit here about a month ago. It's like, these guys are legit. They know what they're doing, like stick with them. There's no need to make a change. Stick with that. <laughs> um, just because, you know, if you're getting great results, don't mess with it, man. Yeah. Um, keep yeah. It rolling. So on that side of it, what's kind of do is just kind of think through a little bit more of kind of what that buyer's journey really looks like. And keep in mind, you have a lot of time to date. So it's not like you see one ad today, I got to hook them today. Let's date your audience. Let's date them for a little bit, add some really good content, add some really good value with it. Like I mentioned earlier, ideally some of that content is what you've already produced or what yeah. you already talk about on a regular basis. So think that through to be able to pull that together before you do make that offer and really just think through that balance between brand of building and that direct response. And again, there's no magic number per se, just rough, rough, you know, 60, 65 to 70% should be more towards that brand of building or the sales activations that reps. Excellent. Excellent. Cool. So the website is mollymarketing.com, M-A-L-Y marketing.com. Links in the description. Steve, thank you so much for uh, sharing everything that you have on today's episode. Yeah, this is awesome. I appreciate it, right? Yeah, really. I appreciate it. And for those of you who have been watching or listening. Uh, I'd love to hear what one major takeaway you got from this and how you might apply it in your business. Um, thank you for, for watching and listening, and I'll catch you again in the next episode. See you soon. 
Thank you once again for tuning in to this daily episode of Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Remember, check out the links with this episode for even more value. Now make sure you like, comment, share, subscribe, and engage in every way you can to keep this show going and growing and delivering daily value to you. I'll catch you soon for your next big breakthrough.